very pleased to have you. Well, thanks. And we're talking about too big to know. Is that yeah, too big, too big to know. Yeah. Um, the hypothesis of the book is that knowledge in the West is um, taking on the properties of its new medium, which of course is the internet, and that many of the properties that we've assumed. Uh, about knowledge for the past 2,500 years or so, right. in fact, are not properties of knowledge. They're properties of knowledge when it has paper and books as its medium. So we have a lot of cultural uh, value built around the concept of, of knowledge. It's one of the longest, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the longest values in our culture. Mm -hmm. We've defined ourselves as the creatures who know, as rational animals or um, uh, being made in God's image. And God, we have frequently thought of in our history as the thinker, as the, the creator who intelligently put the world together, and, or as we used to say, wrote the book of nature. And it's our job as humans, as the, in the image of, of God, um, to figure out what that order is. So it wasn't just a hobby, it was um, an essential part of our, of our self-understanding. Um, so much of how we thought about knowledge, uh, as I say, came from books. And when that, when we change mediums, it's a very big deal. I think that we're changing our, uh, that the, our idea of what knowledge is also changes. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, yeah, that's very interesting. So you basically your idea then is that the book is this sort of self-contained uh, this package of knowledge, right? But now, like all of those borders are are sort of fading away, right? Is that what's happening with the internet? And and if that's the case, is that making us smarter individually, or is it making us dumber individually, as some would say, such as Nicholas Carr or other critics, Mark Borline with his dumbest generation argument? And so what, what would you say to that, to these critics of, of, of this transition from knowledge in books to knowledge on the web? Well, I'm Eli Pariser for, uh, with the filter bubble. Right. And, um, so the grandfather of that, uh, that idea, um, Cass Sunstein and Republic.com, which is the echo chamber argument. Right. If, if you made me respond, and I'll pretend that you are making me do this, um, I would say uh, two things. First is that um, few people deny that if you are interested in knowledge, if you're a researcher of one form or another, and we all are actually at various times during the day, but this is clearly the, the greatest time to be alive. This is the greatest time to be a knowing creature. It's yeah. the amount of, of right, I mean, try to take the internet away from a researcher. Right. You know, she'll, she'll cry bloody murders. On the other hand, it's also a great time to be stupid. So if you <laughs> uh, want to, well, so this is putting it very badly. Um, it's very easy to go down wrong paths and get reconfirmed in those paths. Mm -hmm. It's very easy not only to be wrong, but to be increasingly convinced that you're right when in fact you are really, really wrong. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a problem. Uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, the hopeful thing is, I think, that progress in culture often um, is unevenly distributed. And so, uh, particularly in, in olden times when, when a moneyed white male elite was the only ones who had the opportunity to, to know and to research and to advance. Mm -hmm. uh, even so, and obviously it's much better now, not perfect, but much, much better. Um, even in those circumstances, uh, the people who know how to know and to do research um, uh, are able to pull, pull their culture forward um, behind them. So it may be that that's what will happen here, too. It's also possible that the situation is so different now that that won't happen, that um, the knowing class, I'm sorry to use this sort of language, but the knowing class will become incredibly smart because they have this amazing tool um, and not be able to pull the, the, the entire culture forward. Don't That's know. sort of the H.G. Uh, Wells kind of I dystopian idea, right, of, some, of a future. Uh, it's, it's possible. I remain quite optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize there are huge threats and problems, um, including to the continued existence of the Internet as an open uh, environment. So, you know, you bring up a number of things I want to ask you about, but I, I, I want to, because you talked about this possible dystopian future of this sort of widening digital divide, I wanted to, that makes me think of uh, Kurzweil and his singularity, because I, I kind of conceive of a potential dystopian future where some people are able to do the whole thing where they have the best medical care and they can live forever, and then there's a sort of underclass of people that 
aren't able to access that and they continue to like live short lives and die early like like 20th century people what do you think about Kurzweil's ideas what do you think about the singularity is that being accelerated by these 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 evolutions in information technology that you're talking about or or is that okay so first of all um i think a dystopian future is possible but i remain uh, optimistic mm -hmm. and i think on pretty good grounds but you never know what's going to happen mm -hmm. so uh, so i'm not a dystopian i'm in some ways uh, um i'm a depressed optimist <laughs> okay um uh, and on singularity, so it, the singularity is technically defined is the moment when we're able to install human consciousness into hardware right. and software, right? Um, and uh, Kurzweil is a genius. He's done wonderful things with his genius. And I think this idea is um, a non-starter. I don't, I don't believe in, um, I don't believe that modeling the brain in a computer is a brain. I believe it's mm -hmm. a model of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, you know, I'm not going to survive my own, uh, my, my bodily death if I'm able to model my brain state and, uh, and we know the, the rules by, by which, you know, the program that mm -hmm. the brain is running. The brain isn't running a program. It's not a computer. It doesn't deal with intelligence. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a gelatinous mass that's doing something else. So um, I'm not very much on board with the notion that um, everything reduces to information, and especially to the point where we say that the information is identical to the thing it itself. Um, so I, I, singularity is not an issue for me. Let me ask you about uh, this idea of, uh, you talk about filter failure, you talk about how, uh, you quote Clay Shirky saying, there's no such thing as information overload, there's only filter failure. So do you Yeah, he's good, isn't he? Yeah, of course, he's brilliant. Actually, we've yeah. interviewed him for this class as well. Um, and I, so what do you, do you think that we're going to figure out how to, how to get filters right in the future? Are we like in this transitional weird state where there, we don't There's no such it? thing as getting filters right. It's not a, it's not a um, conceptual possibility. You can get them better or worse, where you are, where that means either um, that it's meeting your particular needs or it's meeting societal needs or both. Mm -hmm. um, but to get a fil to get filters right would mean that you are that there is a right way to view the world. There is a set of things that are objectively um, important, and uh, no, uh, filters are tools, and they're fabulous tools, and we've gotten so much better at them over the past uh, 20 years um, that, and I, I was in the, the search business 20 years ago. Is that right? 1995 um, and somewhat before. Um, and having just search engines that have the capacity that they have now in, terms of it, in volume and the ability to pull out right results is beyond the imagining Mm -hmm. And be so dead simple to use that it is maybe the most used online technology. Mm -hmm. It certainly is the most used online technology. Everybody can use a search engine. Mm -hmm. In the late 80s, early 90s, the notion that end users would be able to do complex searches without, having, without becoming IR specialists, without learning the special language or the query language and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you'd be able to do great searches across large volumes of information, but for that you'd have to, of course, learn, be trained in how to do it, learn the special. Mm -hmm. The notion that anybody could type words into Google, search billions and billions, get them back, inconceivable. So mm -hmm. our, our ability with filters, uh, we cannot, I cannot exaggerate the sort of progress that we've made with filters. Hmm. We will always be making, uh, we're always going to have to do this. The amount that there is to know is going to get larger and larger. The complexity of the information is only going to get larger and larger. And our need to get not only precise, results, but results that are evocative, results that reflect things we, the points of view that we didn't uh, know existed. Those sorts of demands are going to increase. So I'm sure that we will be getting, um, it's such an important technology. I'm sure we're going get, to be getting much better at it. What do you think is the future of the book? Obviously, you, you published your meditation on the future of information technology as a book. Like, what do you think is the future of the book? What are, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I'm just curious. If you take um, books in terms of the structure of the information in them, um, long form argument, that is, you start 
nonfiction book, you're going to start a reader at A, you're going to take her to Z, she's going to believe something at the end that she didn't think she was going to believe at the beginning, but you do it through small, reasonable steps. It's a thing of beauty. Um, we've gotten very good at it, and in our culture in the West, we have exalted books as the highest expression of knowledge. You want prestige as an expert, write a book. You want to understand how pieces go together. In many fields of knowledge, you write a book and you show how the pieces go. Um, I, you know, people are still going to do that, and there's tremendous value in it. It's a, it's a beautiful form of expression. But I think we've already lost the idea that, they, that books are the best expression of how knowledge goes together, or put differently, how the world goes together. Um, it's, it seems to me that we have a much better expression of this, better in all the relevant ways, um, in webs, in networks on the net, you know, a set of links that are related to one another. It's always, they're never bounded, you know, you know but some, some web around a topic is going to be a better resource and have more knowledge expressed in the links and in the arguments that are going on than any single node in that network. Um, a long form argument can be a node in the network. It will be enhanced by, um, so the example I use in the book is uh, Origin of Species. I mean, Darwin's uh, masterpiece. I mean, it's, it is a work of art. It's wonderful, wonderful, and obviously, you know, pretty good science, too. Even that, as a long form uh, work, um, has more value when it's online in a network in which people are agreeing with it, extending the ideas in it, disagreeing with it, pointing out the holes, raising objections and having objections answered, seeing it applied to new fields. Mm -hmm. um, that's the type of webs that we see springing up. Webs are better expression of knowledge, even in, even in its unsettled and even as unsettled and in disagreement than um, long form books generally are. It's a, it's a great answer, and I completely agree with you. But it it it, it ignores, uh, unfortunately, like like the fact that uh, professors need uh, peer reviewed publications to get tenure, and authors need to publish books to get paid. Right? Yes, it does ignore that. <laughs> Well, I think we should leave it there. I think it's a wonderful place to leave it.